Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Dr. Rachel Earls, and I am the medical science liaison for Myriad Neuroscience, the makers of GeneSight. And tonight, I'm going to be your moderator. So let's go ahead and dive in. More than 112 million Americans live in areas with a shortage of mental health specialists, according to the Commonwealth Fund. Experts say this gap will widen over the coming years due to the rising of increased demand for mental health specialists paired with a decreased access to mental health, mental health care specialists. So what this creates, um, this creates a big burden placed on primary care providers. So family practitioners, internists, social workers, OBGYNs, nurse practitioners, and many others. And they're now in the trenches of an escalating mental health care crisis. And so at the completion of this GeneSight Cares webinar, we hope you will have a better understanding of the following. So the importance of screening for depression and anxiety in primary care settings, how best to collaborate with mental health specialists, and practical mental health treatment resources like the GeneSight test that can be available for patients. To help us <clears throat> for this topic, we have brought together an esteemed group of clinicians from a diverse healthcare background. Our panelists include Dr. Crystal Nelson, owner and psychiatrist of Blueprint Psychiatry in Noonan, Georgia. Dr. Nelson, thank you so much for being here tonight. We also have Dr. Charles Cook, an acute care and family practice nurse practitioner for the Oaks Internal Medicine and Endocrinology in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Hi, Dr. Cook. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Robin Miller, a medical, a mental health internist in um, Oregon, and she is visiting us tonight from Hawaii. Nice to see you, Dr. Miller. Nice to see you. All right, we will go ahead and get started. So we'll start with you, Dr. Miller. Um, it is no secret that providers are experiencing an exponential increase in mental health concerns for both existing and new patients. Have you had to change how you treat mental health in your practice? Not really. I mean, I have an integrative medicine practice, so mental health is always really important in my practice. I have noticed an amazing amount of anxiety in people that I never would have expected to be anxious, including mm -hmm. some of my friends, and the people that had anxiety to begin with are far worse. So the only way it's really changed is that I'm more cognizant of how people are feeling. That's wonderful. Thank you. What about you, Dr. Cook? Well, because of the pandemic, the wait time to get into a mental health uh, specialist or consultant has typically run about three to six months. And that's why the GeneSight test has been so beneficial to my practice, because it's an excellent tool to guide that primary care clinician in their treatment of uh, depression and anxiety and other mental health disorders. So it sounds like you guys are both regularly seeing mental health patients in your practice. Is that a correct assumption? Uh, yes, it is. Yes. Okay. So I like to weave Dr. Nelson into this conversation. Obviously, she is a psychiatrist, and so she offers a unique perspective here. And so from your perspective, Dr. Nelson, have you seen changes to existing patients who were well-managed before the pandemic? And secondly, how has this influx of referrals affected or put any strains on your practice, perhaps? Um, definitely in the first year and second year of the pandemic, de I definitely saw an increase in the severity with some of my patients that were fairly stable. So we definitely saw an uptick in anxiety, an uptick in depression. Things are stabilizing, I think, a, a bit now with those that were stable before. But uh, in, in piggybacking with Dr. Miller said, the volume. I mean, we're seeing anxiety and depression in people who had no history of anxiety, depression, very high functioning individuals presenting with anxiety, depression. So it's definitely um, caused us to have to increase providers. Uh, I had to, I, I jokingly say, had to come out of somewhat semi-retirement and pick up more hours um, just to cover the amount of people that are coming through the doors. So uh, it's definitely at crisis level. I would agree with your statement. We definitely are at crisis level. So would you say you're having patients who were maybe well-managed before have increased in the severity of their anxiety and depression? Does this create any of bottleneck effect in terms of allowing new patients into your practice? Absolutely. I mean, you know, those patients where you may have been able to see them every three to six months, 
now needing a bit more frequent appointments, which sure enough creates that, you know, wait time. The Dr. Cook said three to six month waits. I looked at my wait today. It's four months. Um, if you are suicidal, that's not a good thing. Absolutely. And so what we're hearing, we're in a pandemic. We're having increase in mental health care diagnosis, and we are having access issues into mental health care specialists. So as we discussed, this is creating an urgent need for primary care providers to be able to effectively treat mental health conditions. And so I want to defer to you, Dr. Miller, and ask, do you screen for depression in your practice? And if so, how does this work? How does the cadence of that work in your practice? My practice is different than most primary care practices in that I have a fair amount of time to spend with each patient. So I don't do any formal screening. I actually talk to people. Um, new patient appointments are an hour and a half, follow-ups half an hour, physicals an hour, which gives me a chance to really talk to people and find out if they're depressed or anxious. I don't need to do a depression scale to figure that one out. I actually talk to them. <laughs> so, so it, it's so I funny to hear you say that because <laughs> that's such a rare commodity in medicine now. And it, it seems so simple, but it, it's such a wonderful thing when you do have a time to have dialogue with someone and get to know them. So that, that's fantastic. Yeah, it is. And, it, and I know it's not the usual. I know that most primary care physicians and practitioners are so pressed for time. So yeah. the depression scales work for that. And mm -hmm. it can be done by anybody. So by the time the patient's seeing the provider, they have a sense of what's going on. Dr. Cook, do you administer depression screenings in your practice? Uh, we certainly do. We, um, we try to practice the same way Dr. Miller does. We typically spend 45 minutes for each patient. We're, we're privately owned practice, uh, but uh, we do. We do the PHQ-9, PHQ-4, and the ISI and the JD-7, just to add those in. But uh, just uh, I completely concur with Dr. Miller. Taking the time to sit down and talk with the patient listen to them, see what their needs are, is critical. And a lot of those screening questions, you will glean the information from just taking the time to sit down and be an effective listener. We've had previous webinars talking about how it can be difficult to have these conversations with family members, with loved ones, and I'm sure with patients as well. So Dr. Cook, how do you approach this topic with a patient in primary care if you suspect that they may be suffering from depression or anxiety? Well, you know, Typically, because the you know depression is one of the leading comorbidities of several uh, chronic diseases, uh, specifically diabetes, and when you can see that patient fall off the bandwagon on their on tuning their finger stick blood sugars, taking their insulin, uh, doing medical nutrition therapy, doing their daily exercise, you know that something's not right, and until you treat that comorbid condition of depression. Uh, the treatment of diabetes will not get back on track, um, which uh, we really try to emphasize a kind, caring, empathetic approach. That's wonderful. And I agree completely. These mental health conditions don't happen in a vacuum. So it's wonderful that you're looking at it from a holistic perspective. I think that's fantastic. Um, so Dr. Nelson, I guess the question I have for you would be, what do you wish primary care providers would knew or would maybe do before they referred patients to you? So they're, they're seeing mental health, but a lot of them, maybe not Dr. Cook or Dr. Miller, but many of them are just referring over to psych. So is there anything that you wish primary care providers knew or did before that action happened? Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of things. I know that it sounds uh, sort of prepared, but I mean, for a primary care doctor, once they do identify depression or anxiety to do a gene site test, I mean, really would cut down on some of the referrals I even get from the start, because if they were gene site tested and a medication choice is made with as much information as it gives, they may get better outcomes, period, and not have the need for psychiatry. The other part, you said that the screening, I do get sometimes primary care doctors will do the screening, but they didn't look at the screening. So, you know, if the PHQ-9 was done and the score is 25, you know, five minutes to address that it's a, you know, a 25, which signifies severe depression, um, address that, whether the first line of defense is going to be to refer that person to a therapist or over to psychiatry or put a medication on board. I think that the primary care doctor can set their own parameters of if whatever their scale 
uh, that they're using when it reaches a certain number, what's going to be your plan of action there? Are they going over to psychiatry? Where are they going? If it's under a certain range, which would be mild, you know, maybe that's a conversation. You know, it, it could be just a five minute conversation addressing that you saw and acknowledge that their, their mood was in that space. I get a lot of clients who will tell me again and again, I shared with my primary care doctor about my depression or my anxiety and they were so busy. And, and, and that is a real problem because just like Dr. Cook said, that diabetes, that high blood pressure, that heart, all those other things are at the mercy of that depression and anxiety. They, they are. And so they have to be addressed. Absolutely. So a lot of great things. A few things I took specifically from that. One, doing a PHQ-9 isn't enough. Um, a PHQ-9 score of a five yeah. versus a 25 is very different and can elicit right. different actions. So I think that's first and foremost. And secondly, you mentioned the gene site test, and I'm not sure if everyone on this webinar knows maybe what gene site is. And so just briefly, um, it is a genetic test and it acts as a medication selection tool to tell you how your patient's genes may affect their response to some of these psychotropic medications. So um, that's wonderful that you bring that up. Thank you for that. I should also mention for anyone listening on this webinar, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, they will be anonymous. Not everyone can see them. And we have people monitoring the questions and I will try to address them as I'm going along. So just wanted to make sure to point that out. Um, but Dr. Cook, I'm gonna go back to you. So to follow up on Dr. Nelson's comments, what are some ways in which you have collaborated with mental health specialists um, before? Well, uh, go, just uh, referring back to Dr. Nelson, the gene site test is critical. You know, if that primary care clinician will use this tool to help guide them in the treatment of depression, anxiety, or ADHD, or other uh, mental health disorders, it gives that primary care clinician a great basis of why they chose what they chose. And at least if, if I'm not successful in treating that disease, that condition, then I can share that test result with that consultant, with that, with that uh, mental health professional and say, you know, this is what I've done and this is what I've done and why. And it makes a much better logical case of why I chose which drug and why. I just didn't, you know, uh, pick the one that their mother did well on. Or, you know, I've got an excellent scientific uh, background because you look at gene site, you look at the symptom improvement, the, re the decrease in remission rates, you look at the improvement in response. The, the science is solid with tremendous p-values on, on some of the tests that have been done. And it just it really helps guide a primary care person like myself. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, I got a question in the chat about does the gene site test uh, work for patients under 18 years of age? Um, yes, so your patient's genes um, are stable throughout their life. Um, so the information will be good when they're 18 or when they're 98. So yes, it can be used for when patients are 18 years or older. Um, that's an excellent question. In fact, and, I, think it's, I think it's really more, most, I mean, it's important for adults, but for kids to put them mm -hmm. on, randomly on medicines without mm -hmm. knowing their genetic makeup, I, I just don't think it's okay. And I think yeah. gene site is particularly important for children if you're going to put them on antidepressants or medications for ADD. Yeah. And I have to say, I have to say for Dr. Cook, what, what he said, being in psychiatry, if I were to have a conversation with the primary care doctor who said, hey, I did the gene site test and this is why I came to this medication selection. I tried this. It didn't work. And then I tried this. Man, that's that's golden to me because I get the client who has tried, you know, tried and failed for meds. I sometimes can't follow the logic how we got got to this wasn't an adequate trial why was this chosen the patient of course can't communicate this to you always and, and so to be able to follow the train of thought and so I know where to pick up here and and trying to solve this issue I mean that that is an excellent way I think to go into collaboration with a mental health professional I think that's a wonderful point and I think you know, in different fields of medicine, sometimes when I when I go to a primary care doctor or an endocrinologist, whoever I'm going to, it's almost like they're speaking different languages. Yes. So if you can create that bridge between different specialties, I think that's wonderful. Um, and it leads me nicely to one of the next set of questions that I had with you, Dr. Nelson. You talked about welcoming curbside consults. So is that kind of what you were referring to when you said, is that what that means to you when you were talking more? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can create, well, first and foremost, I think it's important that we kind of go back to just the, the basics of talking to each other and connecting with each other. If the primary care doctor and psychiatrist identify that they are referral partners, you know, creating and establishing that relationship, I mean, it really sets the 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 tone for curbside consults where I mean it may take me 30 seconds for Dr. Cook to say hey Dr. Nelson I saw this patient I tried him on Lexapro 20 that was in the gene site test then didn't work we tried this and I say go ahead and, and, and try this and take it up to 40 milligrams that's 30 seconds you, you know versus four months for that client to get in to me for that evaluation and so if those relationships are built with the primary care doctor and the mental health professionals, uh, curbside consults, I, I think most psychiatrists, uh, you, you know, mental health professionals would prefer that, that type of relationship because it, it's a simple, quick decision that may take me a couple seconds. And then again, it opens the door for those ones where Dr. Cook, Dr. Miller say, I've tried five different meds, nothing's working. Okay, now send that person on over and where we can take a deep dive, sit down, kind of figure out what's going on. Maybe we have the wrong diagnosis or something like that going on. It really would, uh, again, just unclog this pipe that we have going on from primary care to specialist. And, and we all know that's not a good working system we got going on right now. Yeah, I think that's wonderful sentiment. Thank you for sharing that. And I think when I talked to Dr. Miller, what I heard her talk about was using an integrative approach in primary care. Yeah. So Dr. Miller, can you speak on that in relation to what Dr. Nelson was just mentioning? Yes. <clears throat> so the thing is that when people are in a situation, stressful situation like the pandemic, they do certain things, certain behaviors that can be self-defeating. <laughs> so they don't eat as well. They don't exercise. They're not sleeping as well. Their, their schedule's erratic that increases the chance for depression and anxiety and it becomes the cycle. So that as integrative approach is looking at people and saying, wait a minute, let's first look at your diet. Let's clean that up. How about Mediterranean style diet? We know it helps with depression. We know it helps bring you to your ideal weight and reduce heart disease. Let's try that and exercise. What about just walking outside in nature? What about taking, you know, gradually increasing the amount of exercise all those things will help people feel better and reduce their anxiety and get them sleeping better. And if all that fails, then we look at medications. And GeneSight has been revolutionary for my practice. It has made such a difference because then I have a much better idea on how to choose medications. And like Dr. Nelson said, if I get stumped, I can call a psychiatrist and say, hey, what do I do now? I've done X, Y, and Z. I need help. So we got a question in the chat that's very relatable to your comments. It says, I'm interested in preventing adverse drug reactions. How reliable is gene site testing and identifying these? So I can say kind of a, a scientific response to this. And if you guys have any comments, I'd love for you to uh, give your clinical expertise as well. So um, we have, uh, we look at two types of genes on the gene site report. One of them are metabolism genes and they can guide information on proper dosing for patients based on their metabolism patterns. And we also look at a set of pharmacodynamic genes, and those genes can tell us information about medications your patients may be at increased risk of side effects for. Um, so GeneSight can provide guidance into which medications to potentially avoid um, if you're looking, um, if you're wondering if your patient may have adverse reactions to a medication. So um, any more comments on, on that from the panelists? I, I find it very helpful. And when people come to me, have come to me on medications and tell me their side effects, and then I get their gene side tests, I'm like, okay, that explains it. Let's switch you to this instead. Makes total sense. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a map and it's great. I, uh, I, I may be inaccurate. That I think it's page nine. Is there, there's a, the polka dot page. I think, is it page nine? <laughs> And I think that I think it's kind of clear which pathways this patient will respond to. Now, in my practice, if I know I've got a lot of patients that are on a uh, specific patient that's on a CYP2D6 pathway, do I need to keep clogging that road? I mean, I should know scientifically, but that's not the right thing to do. And I, but I think that page nine is a real 
critical piece of information that often may, that may not be looked at uh, clearly enough. But if you look at those pathways and what that patient's taking, it should be a kind of a nice bridge about to prevent those things that, that can occur. Yeah, so for those of you who maybe haven't seen a gene site report before, um, there's a part of the report called the gene drug interaction chart. And what it tells you is how every medication on our report is metabolized, what genes are at play in the metabolism patterns. And so you can see which genes your patient has mutations in and how that may have an impact on the metabolism of those drugs. So thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Cook. And um, we also got another related question in the chat um, about what are your thoughts about a patient being on Lexapro? Um, it's working for them, but it showed on the gene site test that it was in the yellow category. Um, she was wondering, should she only stay in green category meds? So again, I'll give my scientific response and I'd love to turn the floor over to you and what you see clinically. Um, so in terms of the three categories, the colored categories, the green, yellow, and red, um, don't take that as only, um, only take medications in the green. Um, you are able to take medications across categories. And the reason that that is, is because medications that fall into the yellow and the red, there are numbers next to them that provide guidance that can tell you why the medication is in that category, but then potential ways to overcome that information. So the primary message I always wanna share with providers is your clinical expertise is still the driver in medication selection with GeneSight. If you think Lexapro is what is appropriate to treat your patient, we will look at why there's a genetic issue at play and potentially create ways to overcome that. So don't feel restricted by the colored categories. Um, Dr. Nelson, do you wanna go ahead and start in any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I had this today. So I had a client who was on Effexor and got the gene site test back. The Effexor was in the yellow. The Effexor is working fantastic for her. Did I take her off the Effexor? No. Um, the effects are working. I did go over the gene site report with her and I shared with her, if we get to a place where this effects her, she's at 150 milligrams of effects her. I said, if this effects her is not working to keep you in remission like you are, we might not consider increasing it based on what this is telling us under this clinical consideration for your effects or we might consider at that point going over to something in the green. But I, I didn't, of course, take her off. It's working. So where you said it's, it's working for the person then, you know, it's not broke. We're, we're leaving it there. If it gets your client into remission, that's the goal. Thank you for sharing. Anything else, Dr. Cook or Dr. Miller? No, I agree. If it's working, I would change it. <laughs> um, I agree completely. And, and oftentimes, you know, in the endocrine world, we'll talk about, well, you know, why are you using 73rd or why are you using older insulins? You know, if I've got a patient at A1C at 6.5, why am I going to reach for a GLP-1 receptor or something different? As Dr. Nelson said and Dr. Miller, if it's working for that patient and I'm uh, ad adequately monitoring, observing that patient and clearly at 6.5 A1C is where they need to be on diabetes, you know, we've hit a home run. Yeah. Perfect. That's wonderful. Um, we got another gene site question. Keep them coming. I love them. So uh, what does it mean essentially if a patient is failing a green category med? So Again, we'll start with my perspective and then to hand it over to the experts. So I think this is where providing context for what the gene site test is, is very important. So the gene site test can tell you which medications may be less likely to work according to your patient's genes. Um, so it is a genetic test. We know that there are many factors that can affect the success of a medication. Genetics is one piece of the puzzle. So if a patient is failing a genetically congruent or genetically optimal medication, they may be failing it for other reasons, whether it's maybe drug-drug interactions or um, you know, many other things. So it's not going to tell you this is the exact medication for your patient. It tells you which medications may be less likely to work. So I'll turn it over to the experts now. Yeah, and this is where you know, we have to be mindful that GeneSight is simply a tool um, that we're using in our medication selection and in our treatment overall of the, the client. So, I mean, sometimes just simply, maybe the patient is failing that medication because that's not the proper diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you could have them diagnosed with depression and maybe they're bipolar. Uh, and so we're in the wrong category of medications totally. So you're not going to get full relief of the symptoms if the diagnosis isn't right and the medication isn't appropriate for the diagnosis. Um, drug, drug interactions, that's a big one, you know, that like Dr. Earl said, it's just a tiny piece. It's an informative piece that we haven't had access to before. 
and it's great, but it's still a piece of the puzzle. You are still the clinician sitting down with that client, gathering all of the information um, before you're prescribing that medication. And there's almost always a, a, a clear reason you'll find if someone's failing that medication in the green, there is usually something that's that's being missed there uh, and, and digging a little bit deeper. That's where the, it, it's helpful for that person then to get to the mental health professional who may do a, a more uh, in-depth evaluation to determine why they might be failing all those medications in the green. Yeah, and that's, I agree. And, and that's where the art of medicine comes in. Absolutely. So maybe they have hypothyroidism. Right. Maybe there's something completely, mm -hmm. something totally different going on. Maybe it has to do with their microbiome, which is becoming increasingly more important mm -hmm. when it comes to depression and mental health disorders. So there's so many things that could be going on that need to be evaluated if someone's failing something in the green. I agree. Absolutely. Um, so we're getting a lot of gene site questions. I'm going to keep answering them because I love them coming in, but I do want to make uh, people aware. So when I said I was a medical science liaison, what does that actually mean? So I'm part of the medical team at Myriad and our entire job is to educate. And so we provide webinars. Uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, for providers who are interested in gene site or who are already using gene site. We recognize that this is a 13 page genetic report and there's a lot of information in it. So um, after the conclusion of this webinar, we can share all of those resources with you to answer these questions, because that is exactly why, why we're here. So I just wanted to make everyone aware of that. But um, the next question that I have is, will the gene site test results change over time um, if lifestyle factors are changed? And the answer is no. Um, that's, that's a great part is your genes are stable. So um, you can use this information for the life of the patients. And while we have more of these um, gene site questions coming in, I'm gonna let them come on in. I wanna ask a question um, from two different perspectives, one from primary care and then one from psychiatry. Dr. Miller, how do you approach talking about gene site with your patients? Well, it's pretty easy. Usually if it's, you get to the point where I think they need to be on medications, what I will do is say, look, there's this great test. It will help me determine what medication to put you on and I, most, Almost everybody's assured, you know, becomes reassured once they know that you have some sort of test that's going to guide you. So I haven't had anybody actually resist and they're all happy. And the cool thing about GeneSight, you can get the test back within 48 hours, the results back so that you can actually treat them based on that result. You don't have to wait, um, especially if you have somebody that's really depressed and anxious. Dr. Cook, uh, what does your conversation look like um, with a patient you think would benefit from gene site? Well, I, I use a lot of analogies and when I meet with patients and I always talk about, could you imagine if I put you, uh, if I started you on insulin therapy without doing an A1C or doing finger stick blood sugars, or I didn't know what your pancreas or your uh, output was or your kidneys were, you'd say, you'd say, Dr. Cook, you've, you've, you've lost your mind. Obviously you have to have that. The days of trial and error medicine need to come to an end. We need to have some type of scientific basis, some type of tool, some something that will help us. And you know, when patients see that, that, uh, that symptom improvement, the increased response, uh, decreased remission, um, it, you know, the cost of this test is nothing in comparison to the cost of a patient who continues to suffer. You know, why should this patient have, be, be tried on four or five different medicines that are ineffective at best? Uh, that lead to uh, worse and more harmful comorbidities. Uh, when I could have simply got the patient the treatment that they needed, uh, I've been very blessed. I've not had uh, any problems with anybody wanting to balk at, uh, uh, at a cost of this test of this magnitude. That's wonderful. What about you, Dr. Nelson? Yeah, so it's, it's part of, you know, my entire practice. So my, my practice, the name of our practice is Blueprint Psychiatry. So I chose that name with the purpose of, you know, creating an individualized blueprint for each patient. And it doesn't really get more individualized than your DNA. So it, it's, it's already up front in, in that um, what my patients come to the practice knowing that we do. So it's just like Dr. Cook, if he's going to, you know, find out that hemoglobin A1C, check, check that blood sugar. It's just part of the workup for my patients before I'm making medication choices and 
patients, I have not had a patient who does not appreciate that because like Dr. Cook said, trial and error days, they're, they're over. No one wants to be a guinea pig on anything. They want to know that you see me and you're treating me, not the 40 other people you saw before me, just me. And so when you tell a patient that you're going to gather as much information as you can about them before you make a choice, they're, they're bought into that. There's just no question about it. And we all want to be treated that way too. Who, who doesn't want to be treated that way? Absolutely. Um, I, I agree completely. And so have you had referrals from primary care that have shared gene site reports with you? Absolutely. So I have patients who've come with their gene site report and they have it highlighted or scratched. I tried this, tried that. Doctor put me on this. It's like their, their blueprint. They come with it. So absolutely. Wonderful. And I tell them to take it to their primary care doctor like that. So that, and I've never heard anybody call it that Dr. Cook, I'm going to use it, the polka dot page. And I'll tell them, <laughs> take this page to your primary care doctor and have them take a look at some of the other medications that you're taking and determine whether or not those are the best choices for you, because those can also influence how well you feel. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So again, it kind of help create that bridge between different specialties, a, a current, a common currency that we can all use a, a similar language, which yeah. I think is wonderful. Um, another question I got is how often do you see reports with entire green pages? So that would mean every medications in the green, um, 0.7% of the time and we've gone over 1.5 million. So it's relatively rare. Um, another question that I'm going to defer to the experts on is when do you bring gene site on board? So I get this question a lot in the field um, and I'd love to hear, we'll start with you, Dr. Miller, and just work our way around when you choose to use gene site. Um, <clears throat> well, I choose to, to use gene site when I'm gonna put patients on a medication, uh, antidepressant or anxiolytic. Um, so that's when I do it. And again, it's like a roadmap and reassuring to the patient that what I'm doing has a scientific basis and that we have some level of success as a result. So that's when I usually, but it, it turns out, I think I did genes, I've done gene sign on almost everybody, to be honest with you, because everyone's got a level of anxiety and depression. And, and then when you tell them about the test, they wanna know the results. Everybody wants to know. There's a lot of curiosity out there. So I've done gene sign on quite a few people, almost a thousand people. Wow. That's incredible. What about you, Dr. Cook? Well, I like to start with the, you know, after I've, I've just, uh, I concur with Dr. Miller and Dr. Nelson, after I've taken the time to talk with the patient and learn what their needs are, because Dr. Nelson's correct, absolutely. We all expect to be treated individually. And when we're seeing that patient, that's their time that mm -hmm. we need to spend with them, not the 40 before. We need to spend that with them. So I, I like after I've done, spoke with the patient, done the screenings, or if I see them something just not working out. I mean, you know, why does a patient that has a 6.5 A1C three months ago now comes in with a nine? I'm on the same medicines. Hmm. Something has changed. Something, uh, something has decreased. Like Dr. Miller saying, they're no longer walking 30 minutes a day. Why? What's drove that? Why are they not getting outside? So I like to use your, I like to use the gene site test as a, as a beginning tool in my in my uh, clinical decision making. Thank you, Dr. Cook and Dr. Nelson. I, I really can't disagree with anything that has been said. I mean, just using that um, test early on, earlier than later. I, I would just say that earlier than later is going to give us better outcomes and have clients happy, clinicians happy, you know, that's a whole other crisis. We could have a whole other talk on the dissatisfaction that uh, healthcare workers in general are having in their fields. And part of it is the reward, not getting people well. And this could help us get that reward as well, getting people well again. That's what we all went into medicine for, to get people well um, and not just to uh, you sort of band-aid sick. We want them well. Yeah, I think that's, that's really powerful. Um, thank you for putting it that way. And I think, like you said, that's the joy of medicine. And so yeah. um, 
That's great to hear. So we wanted to have everyone leave this webinar with something tangible that they can bring back to their practice or use in primary care settings. So GeneSight is one of those tools. But Dr. Cook, you also talked about some online courses um, that primary care professionals can take um, that you found helpful that in treating mental health. Do you mind commenting on those at all? Well, yeah, you know, um, that's the, the online courses and the courses that you could get from your credentialing body. You know, you can take those at your own leisure off of work. You don't have to go back to school to do that. Um, but, you know, the cognitive behavioral therapy is like Dr. Miller uh, uh, and Dr. Nelson have said, you know, exercise is key. Medication is a piece, but it's an important piece, but there's many pieces. But once you you take the time to, to look at the, uh, at the fascinating field of mental health, that's what drove me into uh, furthering my education into mental health. So, uh, but those early courses that you could take with your credentialing body, cognitive behavioral therapy and others by Dr. William Davies are excellent uh, courses provided to a clinician uh, off of work where they do not uh, have to have much uh, time spent. Any other comments from you, Dr. Miller, Dr. Nelson, about um, any other tools? I would, I would just encourage um, the primary care providers to, you know, sort of take that inventory of who, who are the mental health professionals in your community that you're going to regularly refer to, you know, and, and take the time to just have a simple conversation, find out from those mental health professionals, what do they treat? What do they not treat? And if that relationship can be formed, I mean, everybody benefits from that. All the patients benefit, you as a clinician benefit from just um, taking that little extra step to build the relationship. So uh, again, curbside consults now are on the, the table. A lot of things would make, again, managing those mental health patients in your practice when you have 40, 50 patients to see, to know that, hey, I have this great relationship with Dr. So-and-so in a community. I can just call and just run a couple things by them or they prefer to really see, you know, bipolar disorder. So I can send all my bipolar over there, but they don't really prefer to treat the basic depression. Let me manage those in curbside consults. So just kind of creating that again, like we talked about early on, the collaborations. Um, and there's a lot to be learned from the primary care doctor talking to the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist talking to the primary care doctor. That's a CME all in itself. <laughs> you guys can, we can educate each other just in conversations. I agree with Dr. Nelson. It totally helps. Um, yeah. And it's reassuring to me as a physician that I can call a psychiatrist and get reassured that I'm doing the right thing. Because the last thing I want to do is hurt somebody. I right. just want to help them. Yeah. When we're all training and we're in residency, you know, you have everybody around yes. you to ask questions. Is this the right thing? Is this, you know, you can, you know, pick your endocrinologist friends, you know, brain over lunch, and then we all go our separate ways. But we need that. Whole right, right. But we need that whole network in order to take care of one individual. <laughs> one individual is seeing all of us. So, uh, you know, I think we have to do, do a better job at that, of reconnecting with each other so that we do a better job of being able to take care of our communities. It's so funny. I've done a few of these webinars at this point and, and many different talks. And the answer to so many problems is communication and just oh. talking. And it, it seems so basic, but it really is a lost art and it's hard to do, especially with the pandemic and the feelings of isolation. So I just love hearing that because it's something simple and tangible that we can all take and run with. So thank you for that. I, I really appreciate it. Um, we got another question. Do you guys share gene site results with your patient's pharmacist? Dr. Nelson, you can take that one. So I don't send it straight over to a pharmacist. I've, I've never done that. I'm pretty certain with my clients, they've taken it to their pharmacist before because once they get it, sometimes they're quite emboldened with their, with their gene site report. Um, but, but no, I have never sent it to a pharmacist. But that's a good point. You know, sometimes I think the pharmacist is not included in the collaboration um, of the, the care team for the, the patients. And they are a big part of the care team. Um, I have pharmacists as my patients who came to me wanting a gene site report for themselves. 
um, before medications were prescribed. But um, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, I'm not really put much time into that. What about you, Dr. Miller? Yeah, I have a couple really cool pharmacists where I am, and I have shared results with them just to get an idea of what would be best for a patient, but only with the patient's permission. Mm -hmm. But I have, and it's, again, it's like talking to people, collaborating with them is huge, it makes such a big difference. And we have compounding pharmacists that can make tiny, tiny doses of things if that's what we need to do, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. different ways of getting it into the patient cream, under the tongue, swallowing. We have various ways of doing these things safely. So that's kind of cool. Any other comments, Dr. Cook? No, I mean, I, I agree with Dr. Nelson and Dr. Miller. I mean, the taking the time for us uh, clinicians to take the time to speak to each other. And Dr. Nelson's so right. I remember at Walter Reed, we'd all come in and huddle and we could all get, <laughs> and we could all get this help from each other. But you know, and that's what we really need to take more time and to speak to each other and to learn from each other's specialties. Um, yeah, it was always at one in the morning, right? <laughs> right. right. You wake up and you hear in your head, like, I need to reach out to this person always. Um, I couldn't right. remember oh, to do it during the day. <laughs> I love it. Well, we just got a question um, actually about L-methylfolate and the MTHFR gene. So I will just briefly give an overview of what that is for anyone who isn't aware of it. Um, GeneSite offers another genetic test for the MTHFR gene, um, which tells information about how a patient is converting folic acid. And if your patient has a reduction in the folic acid conversion to an active version called L-methylfolate. Um, so I will ask um, Dr. Nelson, um, do you use the MTHFR panel? Yeah, absolutely. So this is where we really hit on like what Dr. Miller saying that integrated approach, because this is going to be, you know, that opportunity to have conversation with your client about diet. Um, so if they have some uh, mutations in those genes or, or they don't, you know, this again is a great opener. And so I, I have conversation every day with clients about what they're eating. Are they exercising? So I'll say, you know, medications help you to hold on to some chemicals, but first those chemicals have to be made and how they are made is based on what you are eating, the chemical, the things that are going into your body. If you have the genes to process and synthesize those chemicals. So we can't miss that part. Um, are we actually making enough uh, to start with? And so it's a real easy flow into, and sometimes it is, you, you know, you see where just adding that L-methylfolate for someone can make a big difference. I mean, a big difference. And, and, and there's not a person, honestly, probably right now on the plane who would not prefer to take a medical food or supplement or vitamin before they would go to antidepressants or, you know, medications that every, everybody would choose that. We all as physicians would choose that first. So it's a, a, a very important thing, I think, to look at. I, I agree. I, I test almost everyone yeah. for that mutation. Um, and you can just do that on a regular blood test um, if you're not going to do the gene site test. Mm -hmm. And it does, it, certain mutations will increase the risk for heart disease. So that's mm -hmm. another reason to do that test. Yeah. I've had patients who, um, and I've shared this in some of my uh, talks that I've done. I've had patients who have had, you know, years of, of, of miscarriages. Yes. And did not know that they had that mutation and they carry a baby to term yeah. uh, for the first time. So, you know, and, and not to mention the amount of trauma and pain that causes someone to miscarry multiple babies and just something as small as is finding out that this is something that could, could help them. So um, huge, we, we definitely can't miss that part. Yeah, and I think some of the OBs are finally checking. Yeah, yeah. And the I, have L-methylfolate in it. Absolutely, absolutely. I When I first started, I started do, I guess it's been about six, six seven years. I would uh, send that back to some of the OBs for them to change the prenatals that they were giving the clients because I would get a lot of OBs referring to me for, uh, you know, their, their pregnant patients who were depressed or anxious. And sometimes it was simple, just switching the prenatal, you know, just give them a little bit of cushion until they could get to a place out, outside of the pregnancy if we needed to do something later. So 
And actually the effects of L-methylfolate are pretty quick. Yes. It doesn't take as long as antidepressants do, which is really impressive. So, so we just got a message um, from one of the providers on the call and it's very much providers helping providers. So I just wanted to share it. Um, I also want to put in a plug for using PHQ-9 and GAD-7 for tracking progress with the use of these medications. It gives us a lot of information to have conversations with my patients. So another great resource. Thank you for sharing um, for that panelist. And we just got medications or got questions about medications on the GeneSight report um, and who to use these on. So um, it looks at psychotropic medications. So antidepressants, um, anxiolytics and hypnotics, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, as well as medications for the treatment of ADHD. So we have stimulants and non-stimulants as well. Um, so they were asking if we were um, considering looking at other types of medications, but gene site is specific for psychotropic medications and ADHD medications as well. Um, and we just got an, another positive comment about people having their MTHFR genotyping done and what a benefit that made for them. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, so we're at 7.45 now. So I wanna make sure again that we end this webinar with people feeling like they you know, have something to go back to their patients with. So obviously the gene site test came up a lot. Um, is, and I'll just kind of have, go around the circle, starting with Dr. Miller, Dr. Cook, and Dr. Nelson. Is there anything else from your perspective, whether it's primary care and psychiatry, that you want to make sure that has worked really well for your patients in terms of identifying your treatment that you would want to share with your colleagues? Well, for starters, the gene type test is really easy to do. So the thing that stops a lot of providers is they say, I don't want to do all that paperwork. It's whatever. But it literally takes three minutes to enter the data for the patient and get them a kit. They can, they can be sent a kit or you can do it in your office. It's really easy. And as I said before, um, it, it comes, the results come back really fast. So you can act on them maybe within the same week. So it's just, I don't know why anyone wouldn't do it. <laughs> and I think eventually it'll become part of regular medical care. It'll be just what you do. Do the blood test, you do the gene site test. That's what I'm guessing. Thank you. Dr. Cook? Uh, I agree with Dr. Miller. You know, it's, it's time that we start taking a holistic approach to the, in, to the, to the patient, looking at, uh, the, uh, at the disease conditions and what can cause the, the disease conditions. What are, the, what are the triggers? What are the, you know, what's causing the pathophysiology? And as Dr. Miller said, and I agree with him 100%, uh, this will be just a rudimentary test. It's just like we're ordering a CBC or a CMV. You know, this is going to be a baseline test on how we should move forward in, in the attempt to treat this disease. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it's minimally invasive. Uh, it's, uh, it will save you so much time on the back end. And it gives primary care clinicians when they've got that patient that comes in with that spouse and that spouse says, you know, why did you choose uh, X, X drug? Well, this is why I chose it. And this is the basis that I chose it with. It gives you a great tool to, to supplement your decision making. Thank you. Dr. Nelson? Yeah, I mean, I just I just will piggyback off of the same, the gene site tests, of course, being added to the primary care offices on a more regular basis. And then the screening, screening, um, whether you're going to talk to that client or you're going to have a screening tool, but you have to screen for the mental health uh, conditions in your practice. Otherwise, you know, it assists you or shooting yourself in the foot with whatever you're trying to manage. So to screen and then to have a, a plan of attack once you identify that depression, anxiety, or whatever that mental health disorder, you know, again, having your plan of attack, when do I refer out, having that step of maybe I do gene site tests and I try some medications that are appropriate for this client before I refer out to decrease my chances of needing to refer out and increase my chances that my clients are going to be able to get into the uh, mental health professional and get treated. So I, I think just kind of setting up that system in the primary care office, but we're no longer at a point where we can, um, you can't see 50 people and ignore and not ask people if they have anxiety, depression, you just you cannot. That, that is a cycle that no one's really going to win with, with that. And it's all, we already see that happening. 
I have high functioning clients who come into my office. And when I say high functioning judges, lawyers, mm -hmm. doctors who went to their primary care do doctor and the primary care doctor blew past them telling them that they were depressed. So if, if the, the judge, <laughs> you know, gets blown off, how many people are getting blown off when they say, hey, I, I, I'm not doing well. So we've got, we've got to put an end to that. Yeah, and like many solutions, active listening is a part. Um, yeah. So thank you for bringing yeah. that up. That's, we could do a webinar with that within itself. Uh, yeah. We got one more question that I think is really good and I'm, I'm happy to end on this one. So it was, it's discussing when um, to use GeneSight. So it's, you know, do you use it before a patient fails a medication, do you use it um, after? So I can answer this from a research perspective, but um, I know every healthcare provider has a little bit of a different take on it. So Dr. Nelson, I'll just let you finish. Um, but so uh, the clinical trial called the guided trial, which looked to see if having access to GeneSight helped to help with medication selection led to better outcomes for patients compared to treatment as usual. Um, we, the inclusion criteria for that clinical trial was a patient had to fail one medication. So from a scientific perspective, we usually provide guidance saying that a good time to bring GeneSight on board is after a medication failure. Um, Dr. Nelson, when do you usually bring GeneSight on board? So I, I mean, for, for me, by the time they get to me as a psychiatrist, they've failed far more than one. So it's, it's very early on. So right at the beginning, it's just a part of me gathering the information. Now, that doesn't always mean that I'm going to put the patient on medication, <laughs> you, you know, but I'm, I'm preparing for if we have to get to that place, I'm not going to wait till we need to, to put the medication on board and then gather the information. So I'll gather all the data, then we come up with a plan. Sometimes that plan might be just exercise and eating well but we have all the data there that we need so that we have, again, if this doesn't work, then we go here, then we go here, and we're not wasting um, any time should we get to the, that dire place where medication is, is needed. So in my office, it's upfront from the beginning. And how does that differ from what you see in primary care, Dr. Cook? Uh, what, what, what we try to do, what I, how I, I practice, I like doing that test on the, when I identify that, uh, that there's a, uh, an opportunity, patients suffering from depression, uh, so to speak. Uh, I like to order that test up front, along with, as Dr. Miller says, and Dr. Nelson, you know, it would be prudent to also order your thyroid test, your CBC, your CNP, your A1C. You want to take a whole, you want to look at that patient up front and find out, you know, uh, what is the root cause of this problem? But I, I prefer to use it up front uh, and uh, uh, in the treatment of the disorder. I would agree. I, but then again, you get, I'm sure Dr. Cook's got seen a lot of people who come to him already mm -hmm. on a bunch of medicines. That's when gene site is also invaluable because a lot of people who are sick are sick from side effects from the medicines they're on. And GeneSight really has helped me sort that out with quite a few people. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your wisdom, your time. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you for all the attendees. Um, we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your schedule to come here uh, about the treatment of mental health, uh, something we're all very passionate about. So um, we will go ahead and end tonight with a sincere thank you from GeneSight team. And, um, well, we will look forward to our future webinar. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.